Okay, I, I believe we can begin. Um, or I don't know whether we've begun or not. But um, I want to ask the, the three speakers, do you mind if I give a brief definition for social justice? I don't want to step on anybody's talk. Sure. Okay. Because uh, social justice is something that it's hard to not be for justice. Um, but if I were asked, what actually is social justice? I found myself at a loss. So the, the definition is useful. Um, I see we have a number of speakers. And are you three ready to begin? Sure. Sir. OK. So what I would like to do is to introduce our speakers um, each time before they speak. And I will start with Brad. And, and Brad Kirshner is a school leader, an independent scholar, currently serving as head of school at Kimberton Waldorf School. He received his graduate education at the University of Chicago and Boston College and is a co-founder of the Reconstitution Project a metapolitical think tank. His first book is Understanding Educational Complexity, Integrating Practices and Perspectives for the 21st Century Leadership. So this group's going to talk about social justice, which I found a reasonably good definition for social justice. Social justice was defined as full participation in social and balancing of benefits and burdens by all citizens resulting in equitable living and a just ordering of society. Um, I will speak for the United States alone here and say that's something that we really desperately need right now. So, Brad, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And yeah, I think that definition is a good start because it points to how uh, it's sort of aspirational, you know, sort of something that we're that we're striving for. So before I dive in, I actually just want to um, name sort of that we do have an awareness of our positionality in this conversation. Um, you know, there's something that Steve and Michael and I spoke about as we were thinking about this presentation and just sort of wanted to, to name and acknowledge that we're that we are aware of how we've been racialized and gendered. And it's something that we thought about um, and we didn't necessarily choose the constitution of the panel, but we just wanted to, to name that. And for now, just leave it as an open question of whether, whether our perspectives um, are something that needs to be justified in those terms or, or not. Was, I, just, I just wanted to name that and leave it as an open question before we begin. And hopefully today, some of the, some of the thoughts that we'll be sharing might actually give us some tools to think about that question with sort of how do you how do you justify and to what extent you need to justify your positionality when engaging in a topic or a conversation? So my piece here as a sort of intro to the session, I want to offer a frame for understanding justification systems theory, which is the sort of theoretical framework within um, the theory of knowledge that, that, that Greg Henriquez is putting forth that's sort of framing this whole conference. And then, so then we can think about, you know, where we're at and what's happening in the realm of social justice in the context of understanding the justification hypothesis and justification systems theory, which briefly stated just states that, you know, there has been um, an evolution of language and that the evolution of propositional language generated question and answer dynamics and created this adaptive problem of justification for people and that this actually is part of what has led to the emergence of culture with a capital c right so in sort of greg's framing we actually become persons through socialization into systems of justification right so we're all engaged in this ongoing back and forth dynamic with other people where we have to explain and justify our behavior and our thoughts and there's a sort of inherent evolutionary pressure in that where we're constantly having to refine and modify and hopefully over time improve our thought and our behavior in relationship to how we justify those things. So it's an interesting 
um, insight, I think, and framework for just understanding what human culture is and what the socialization of people actually um, looks like. And one of the things to note there is that we're not only in relationship to brute facts, right? We, we actually are justifying our behavior and our thinking in relationship to both facts and values. And when we think about values, we would also include things like ideals and aspirations, right? So we are, we are storytelling people who have values and ideals and aspirations, and we're always negotiating our behavior and our thoughts in relationship to our values and also to to facts and truth as best as we understand them. So that's the sort of process we're engaged in collectively throughout history. And it gives us also a way to think about modernity and the modern world and sort of what constitutes the modern world, or at least one way of thinking about it. So one thing to pull out there that is meaningful and important is that, you know, one of the ways that we can understand modernity or the modern world is by thinking about what were the values that really emerged and became very prevalent and dominant that had a big influence on how people work to justify their thought and behavior. Um, so for instance, what comes out when we think of the modern world is often the sort of trinity of liberty, equality, and fraternity, right? And the modern world is the social cultural world in which those values actually became very widespread. And that created a lot of tension um, and it really problematized a lot of human thought and behavior, right? So much human thought and behavior that had been taking place around the planet was not in alignment with and was not justified with, um, um, justified by those values of liberty, equality, and fraternity. So this led to a lot of tension and it led to a lot of change. And one, I think, meaningful way to understand, for instance, the process we went through with the abolition of slavery and the establishment of civil rights and actually moving towards social justice can be well understood as a process by which we had to continually try to align our behavior and our thought with these values that had become very widespread. And I think that's a really helpful frame and we can see that happening. Uh, we can see that that is what happened to some degree, but it was messy and there were so many contradictions of behavior and value. Um, and those contradictions and those tensions and those hypocrisies that continued for instance, in you know ongoing debates around the founding fathers, for instance, there was such hypocrisy and such a disconnect and so many contradictions between behavior and values that it was this weird, pretty long period of time where people could see, and we can especially now see very clearly in hindsight, that what they were doing was not at all justified by their own values. And yet there was this striving toward those values at the same time. Um, but one thing that's happened, and I think it's helpful for us to look at what's happened since that time, especially in these past 50 or 60 years, as we interrogate the past and as we see those hypocrisies and we see those contradictions, it, there's been a lot of confusion around how to interpret that and how to understand that. And there's been understandable and expectable conflict around how should we understand and interpret those contradictions and tensions. And one of the things that's happened is a, 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 a criticism and a deconstruction of those modern values themselves, right? So we've sort of lost faith in those values and people have been pointing out their limits, how they didn't really lead to behavior and thought that they aspire to and that we would want. And I think what we're in right now is a sort of process of um, disorientation, confusion, hopefully recalibration in terms of how do we reorient ourselves toward values that we can use to justify our behavior and stay sort of coherent as a culture. Um, and what's happened too with the sort of post-modern drive for social justice, we see a critique of those modern values and a search for new values that can help orient our behavior. So we end up with things like equity, which I think acknowledge that there is this drive toward goodness and truth and social justice in that, but there's also been some confusion about, well, what exactly does that mean? How do you apply that to behavior, right? Are we talking about equal outcomes for every person in every way? Are we talking about equal outcomes for groups? Who defines the groups? Is that even coherent and possible? It's actually not if you really dig into it. So there's confusion around that. 
there's also this notion of relativism as like one striving for the value of equality is to say, well, we're all equal. That means all of our thoughts are equal. All of our beliefs are equal. But then how do you justify behavior in a framework where everyone's thoughts and beliefs are equal? You can actually justify any behavior in that framework of relativism, right? So that doesn't really work either. So we're bumping up against some real cultural problems in trying to find new coherent uh, value sets that orient our behavior and that we can justify well in a sort of um, diverse marketplace of ideas. So I think that's a helpful way to understand kind of where we're at and where we got to. And also looking at our current social world, we can see how those, 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 those tensions and contradictions and lack of clarity around what values are orienting and justifying our social behavior have led in some way to some regressions, I would argue. So we see, you know, a lot of the social dynamics that have existed throughout humanity in the pre-modern and modern world are still also operating and existing today. So we still are seeing forms of tribalism and forms of regression to smaller group identity where within that group, maybe you have values that justify behavior, but it's fundamentally opposed to the values and behavior of other groups. And that kind of social cultural regression and sort of neo-tribalism is part of what we're seeing now. But if we take a step back through this frame, we can kind of see why that's happening maybe a little bit better and also hopefully see a way out of it. Um, another thing to highlight too that we're dealing with now is that that regression into sort of pre-modern in some ways, social dynamics in the absence of overarching modern ideals that we all buy into and agree collectively that we should be justifying our behavior in light of those values. In the absence of that, we regress. And then we're also plugged into a whole new technological infrastructure where the dynamics of our media ecology actually exacerbate that neo-tribalization. So we're dealing with a sort of postmodern technological media architecture at the same time as we're sort of regressing in some ways um, to some at least non-modern sort of value orientation. So it's a very confusing space to be in, but at the same time, we can see that there's this drive toward social justice. There's this drive toward goodness and truth and beauty that people still have. And it seems like we're trying to find our way there, um, even, if it, even if it's sloppy. And I think what, what my hope is, is that this framework helps us to see, okay, we sort of can understand that we can, we can, we can understand it in a way too that doesn't, you know, pin the blame on any particular group of people or other any particular group of people, but we can sort of have this collective sense of this is the process that we're engaged in. These are some of the underlying dynamics that are at play as we try to justify what we're doing. And um, my screen just changed. I'm not sure if other people's screen just changed. Um, yeah, well, tomorrow, I think you started sharing. Well, I'll, I'll, I, I will I will keep going. Do, really, so that's that's the framework. And just to wrap up, I think that where we can see where we need to go is that we actually can see, I hope, the real value and importance of the function that shared overarching values served and a sort of coherent social story to orient and justify our behavior with a shared identity is sort of what we need. And I think that's what a lot of communities are striving for. For instance, the, the sort of meta-modern movement is based and founded on some awareness of this, that we have to actually bring the pre-modern, modern, and post-modern together and create a new story of value, right? Like my, my, my brother, David um, J. Temple, right? Talks about a shared story of value that's based on first principles and first values, right? And they actually just, just came out with a new book, First Principles and First Values, that's really touching on a lot of these same themes. Um, so it gives us at least an orientation and a directionality. And for me, the shared story is our evolutionary story, right? We are all collectively, globally, as humans, in one evolutionary story. And I think that that is really obvious to a lot of people, but it's not actually yet really well established in an obvious way for all 8 billion of us yet. 
Um, but it seems to me like that's where we're going. Um, so I hope that that makes sense. And I hope that that's helpful. And I'll actually just 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 wrap up there and then look to see if there's space to um, build on what Michael and, and Steve want to share. Waldemar, I can't hear you. You're muted. I'm not obviously not a power user. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, does anybody have any pressing question at this point for Brad? Okay, then if not, then I believe we go to Steve Quackenbush. And Steve is Professor of Psychology and Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Maine, Farmington. Though a general, generalist by inclination, the focus of his scholarly work is narrative approaches to the study of moral development. That looks perfect. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, he also has a long, uh, let's see, and yet, um, and has co-authored with his students an essay entitled, And Yet Your Duty is to Hope, The Positive Psychology of Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, so, Steve, please go ahead. Thank you, Waldemar. Um, okay, so um, I have been teaching at the University of Maine Farmington since 2003. And since 2019, I've been serving as Dean of Arts and Sciences. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, several um, staff and faculty worked together as a team to submit a proposal for a Title III five-year grant entitled the Belonging Initiative. We were awarded the grant, and so we are now embarking on a five-year long quest to enhance, foster, um, enrich, deepen a sense of belonging at a small public residential liberal arts campus. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about it, the project will include a diversity space that will be equipped with materials for faculty, staff, and students. Um, funding for Diversity Awareness Week, which will allow all on campus to celebrate various cultures of people at UMF, um, brown bags for first generation faculty and students to informally discuss imposter syndrome, stereotype threat, threat first generation challenges. We also have something um, memorably entitled JEDI Student Training, which actually is an acronym, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Training, um, that will help students and faculty um, become more aware of and more open and welcoming to um, diverse groups on campus. Um, okay, so that's our vision. That's our project. Um, the Title III application does not require a deep, I'll call it a deep justification of the DEI program. Um, and so, I mean, I, it's sort of presumed these are good things to do. Um, and so the problem for me, and I've just been thinking a lot about this in the last year, is thinking about what it is we're doing and why. And the way I want to frame the justification for this belongingness initiative is in reference um, to a philosophy of education um, that was developed by a theologian named Paul Tillich. And he speaks of three aims of education um, that I think can help give us a kind of clarity as to why we're doing what we're doing with DEI and belongingness education. The three aims, um, I'll just give you the words first and then I'll clarify what these mean. Technical, humanistic, and inductive education. So, okay, what's technical education? Technical education is, is what we normally think we're doing in a classroom. We're teaching stuff. Um, so technical education can include skills, cognitive competencies, anything that's valued by a culture at a given point in history. Um, it could be learning statistics, research design. It could include acquisition of a rich knowledge base about human culture and history. Um, I would include in technical education something Greg Henriquez calls 
woke 1.0, which Greg Henriquez embraces as something important for us to consider. Um, according to Henriquez, to be aware of, i.e. woke to, the systematic injustices that marginalized groups have faced, and to be concerned about inequality and lack of fairness across many domains of identity and, and class, that is what he calls woke 1.0. This mindset acknowledges that it is a perspective and that there are a diversity of perspectives, but that is fine. Part of woke 1.0 is to be committed to the liberal ideal of reasoned argument, free speech, and differing opinions through constructive dialogue. I will classify all of that as part of technical education. And technical education can be as concerned with cultural values as it is with fact. All right, so then two, um, <clears throat> humanistic education. This part of education is helping, creating a climate where students can realize personal goals, um, actualization of personal potential. Um, and this is certainly important too. We wanna help our students find new paths to self-actualization, um, perhaps as a result of taking our classes, perhaps through other kinds of activities. Um, but considered by itself, humanistic education, just like technical education, is not enough. Um, I'm reminded of B.F. Skinner, who once um, chided Carl Rogers, who emphasizes self-actualization. B.F. Skinner comes back and says, self-actualization for what? For what end? I mean, we need to be thinking as an academy. We need to be thinking as a culture about the ends of our personal pursuits. So we have technical education. We have humanistic education, which is personal and developmental. The third domain, and um, Tillich thinks all three work together in a healthy dialectic. The third domain is what he calls induction. Um, and induction, the inductive education is a pulling out. We're pulling students out of themselves and repositioning them into a meaningful cultural group. Tillich uses the example of American history in the United States, where the purpose is not simply to teach the content of American history or even the values of Americans in American history. That would be technical education, but rather um, to induct students into an authentically American way of life. Um, similarly, when I teach a psychology course, I'm engaged in a kind of induction. As a psychology professor, I want to induct students into the small group that is our psychology department. I want them to think perhaps about themselves as student members of a professional group, the American Psychological Association, or as members of a broader community of scholars. Um, with accompanying responsibilities. But induction, whatever value it may play in helping students understand themselves as members of a broader community, um, can't be the solution to the problem of belonging because we're not in a position to determine the groups that ought to matter to individuals. Um, and there is a real danger on the part of an academic community of accenting the value of certain types of groups, the academic and professional, and downplaying other types of groups. Um, we recognize certainly that such non-academic, non-professional groups, for example, a religious community, may have profound personal significance to their members, but they are not comfortably assimilated yet into the discourse of the community as a whole. Um, the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre, in a classic text entitled Anti-Semite and Jew, um, offered a scathing critique of anti-Semitism in French culture in the middle of the 20th century. Yet, after analyzing anti-Semitism as a sort of will to hatred, he turned his attention to the well-meaning Democrat, the liberal, who simply sees people as people without any obvious bigotry or prejudice. This liberal may be cognizant of the historical roots of anti-Semitism. Um, that is, they may have achieved what Henriquez calls woke one, but their overarching concern is to simply recognize people as people. Sartre is skeptical of this position. The Democrat in Sartre's view, quote, wants to separate the Jew from his religion, from his family, from his ethnic community, in order to plunge him into the democratic crucible where he will emerge naked and alone, an individual in Sartre's solitary particle like all other particles. 
Sartre continues, quote, there may be detected in the most liberal Democrat a tinge of anti-Semitism. He is hostile to the Jew to the extent that the latter thinks of himself as Jew. Concretely, the liberal Democrat fears the awakening of Jewish consciousness in the Jew. Returning to the problem of induction, we must remain perpetually aware of the negative space in human cultures, groups of which we are not members, groups that we will never experience from the inside, but nevertheless matter to us. They matter not simply because we want to understand, but because we need them to be a part of our community as we are a part of theirs. As such, because these groups are never absolutely identifiable and numered, as such, we're in a perpetual state of disequilibrium or metastable equilibrium that can be decentered at any moment. Um, returning to the beginning, I mentioned something called Jedi um, training. Um, I ran across an interesting critique of Jedi training, and I want to share this quote. This is from a, a Scientific American artic article from 2021. Um, Hammond is the author. While an overarching goal of Jedi initiatives is to promote inclusion, the term Jedi may make people feel excluded. Star Wars is popular but divisive. Identifying our initiatives with it may nudge them closer to the realm of fandom, manufacturing in-groups and out those unfamiliar or uncomfortable star with Star Wars, including those hurt by the messages it sends, may feel alienated by the parade of jokes, puns, and references surrounding the term Jedi. Um, so in closing, um, I want to say um, that um, my obligation as a professor, as an administrator, as project director for a Title III belonging project um, is not to embrace my students' values as my own, but to acknowledge and respect their personhood as they are willing to share it, complete with their affiliations to identity and culture groups, and to work to create a home where their values and personal projects can be actualized. We ultimately fulfill our educational mission by getting to know our students, situating our students in broad, broader communities, allowing these broader communities to effectively open up new questions and problems for all of us, and exploring the implications of engagement in multiple communities for personal and professional development. Thank you, Steve, very much. Any particular pressing questions for Steve at this point? If there are questions, just simply raise your hand and we'll proceed then. Okay, then we come to Michael Maskell. I've known Michael and Stephen for a while and Michael's um, bio sketch is that he is a professor of psychology at Merrimack College and director of Creating Common Ground, a nonprofit that seeks novel ways to bridge possible political identities. So, uh, Mike, please go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Thanks so much, Waldemar. Um, <clears throat> I'm so glad that people are not using PowerPoint. Uh, leaves room for me to. <laughs> Hopefully I won't use it poorly. Um, share my screen. Okay, good. I hope that we can you can all see and hear me well. <clears throat> so um, I want to... Um, address the issues and piggyback very much on what both uh, speakers have said, um, and particularly uh, um, Steve's, because he's talking about uh, higher education. Um, a collaborative path to social justice, and I want to use the case of transgenderism as a uh, as a as an as a case for how it is it might be possible for us to to bridge divides on difficult uh, political issues relative to the question of social justice, uh, or uh, an alternative title for this will be social justice without justification, uh, and hopefully I'll make that clear as time goes on. So. Let me begin. Um, our politics are polarized and, molar and, and moralized. Uh, different people uh, have different political positions, but it seems to me that we increasingly treat them as moral, uh, moral identities, uh, moral absolutes even. Uh, we're polarized 
and lack moral humility at the same time. If I'm moral and I have a moral identity, if I identify my moral sense of self with a political position that is moral, well, then you must be immoral. And I think that this is one of the major things that uh, is, is dividing us uh, these days, is this question of, of, of moral identity and lack of moral humility. It leads us to something like this. You're out of touch. Well, you're stupid. You're crazy. You're immoral. You're evil. You're inhuman. That in each side of political debates, and increasingly, of course, in social justice debates, we have this polarization where each side is seeing the other as out of touch, crazy, stupid, and even evil. If we see the other as somehow morally inferior uh, to us, it is very easy to dehumanize them. And if we dehumanize them, we can simply dismiss what they have to say. This is a problem. Now, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, well, that sounds like something we should bring, be, should be able to bring us all together. Who could disagree with diversity, equity, and inclusion? Aren't those good things? I want to argue that um, DEI, obviously, those words are great things. But I worry very much that the way in which DEI has been promulgated on college campuses and in many, many other places, including the business world, has been done so uh, as a form of ideology, as a form of moralized ideology. Um, a major point that I want to be making here is that there are many, many pathways to social justice. There are many, many pathways to DEI. There are many, many ways to understand whether even DEI is a good thing, what the end is, as um, as uh, uh, Steve has been pointing about, what are our ends? Um, who could disagree with DEI? Well, who could disagree, I'm going to suggest, is that's actually part of the ideology, that you're not supposed to disagree with it. And if you do disagree with it, well, there are problems there with you because we have this moralized uh, dichotomy. Here's how I am thinking about DEI as an ideology, at least from my personal perspective. This is how I often experience the way in which DEI initiatives uh, have been launched. DEI statements are founded, I suggest, on ideological assumptions, promulgated as uncontested, factual, or normative. They, are, they include such things as this. There should be some sort of proportional representation in, in an organization, for example, by race, by sex, by gender, by sexual orientation, or some such thing. If that is not there, there's a problem. Marginalized groups have not advanced because of systemic power differentials, where systemic power differentials is defined in a certain and particular way. I actually believe, for example, that... Um, Marginalized groups have not been advanced because of systemic of systemic racism and systemic sexism. However, I don't believe that the system is a static one. It's a dynamic one that has many, many, many causes, uh, which in um, which there are plenty of good guys and bad guys uh, and, and people who are not blamed at all. It's much more complex than we might ordinarily think. Advancement of marginalized groups should proceed through selective hiring and promoting practices. Diversity, anti-bias, anti-racism training, and speech codes are means to achieve DEI. Uh, but mostly, and I believe, that when we think of DEI as an ideology, there's this sense, in my personal view, that we have to get people who think wrong, them, to think right, like us. And when we do that, in my opinion, what we're doing is we are moralizing our positions and, and taking away the moral identity of the other. We are, in a sense, dehumanizing the other, demoralizing the other in such a way that, um, that their, their arguments and their beliefs are, are easily dismissible. I want to propose an alternative. A collaborative pathway to social justice, a different way, a different way of thinking about what we're doing and how we how we should go about doing it. And what I want to make the point is that, one, there are multiple pathways and indeed multiple definitions of social justice that we must entertain and that we should uh, we should acknowledge multiple pathways and multiple 
definitions. The currently dominant pathway is one that, in my view, risks alienation and ineffectiveness. I mean, there are many studies that show, for example, that anti-bias training and such things actually are counterproductive rather than productive. An alternative ethos is one that I suggest would be organized around something like collaborative problem solving, using the enormous uh, body of knowledge and skills and practices organized around collaborative problem solving and conflict resolution in the uh, in the in the in the attempt to to resolve questions of social justice. Here's what an ethos of collaborative problem solving would look like to me. Well, we have two people. Um, well, we start with justification processes that exist. Um, what do we have? Well, we have two people who have different ideologies. This is the way things seem to me seem to be to me today. We have people with different moralized, not only different ideologies, but different moralized ideologies. I'm right. You're wrong. This leads to political positions, different political positions, okay, on issues of whether it is race, sex, uh, sex, sexual orientation, inclusion, all the rest of it. Some people believe one thing. Other people believe another. This leads to conflict. And so the conflict has its origins first in moralized ideology. There's more. The political positions are not simply a product of ideology, but they're also a product of human needs that lie beneath those ideologies and, and motivate them. And these human needs generate political positions as well, but we don't acknowledge them. We don't look at them very much. We focus on debates about moralized ideologies, and we don't focus very well on the human needs and problems that individual groups are trying to, to, to solve. We'll, because of our ideologies, we, we dismiss uh, the other, and we don't even look at the needs, the human needs that make those ideologies uh, uh, good for those people. And third, there are epistemic processes. There's how people experience events. There's, if you will, knowledge about, about the various issues. Uh, and we disagree about the knowledge. We disagree about facts. Um, and those disagreements come from our ideologies. And so why resolving political conflict is so difficult? Take a look, at least from my point of view, is because we have political conflicts social justice conflicts that are organized by moralized ideology, by different needs that people have, needs that motivate moralized ideologies and needs that are defined by moralized ideologies. We have knowledge that is biased by our moralized ideologies all at the same time. This is an overdetermined system for, for entrenched political conflict. And again, this is true when it comes to social justice issues as well. We have to get people to think, the wrong people to think right like us. And that's what's happening when we have political conflict. What's the antidote? Well, the key for me, I'm going to suggest, the antidote has to do with getting rid of all the rest of ideologies, all the rest of it, the, 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 our differences about facts, and starting with needs. Starting with the human needs of different people on different sides of an issue. Start with those human needs. Attend to these needs with care, compassion, and moral humility. Bracket our moral uh, ideologies, the most important and difficult thing to do. Start with human needs and ask, what's the problem our interlocutor is trying to solve? What's the hurt? What's the, what's the plea? What's the, what's the soft underbelly underneath the moralized ideology that people are, are arguing for? This is our biggest challenge, and it is hard. So um, how can we do it? Let's be more specific. I want to propose two phases of socio-political problem solving that can help us solve problems of uh, social justice. One is collaborative problem solving. The other is ideological engagement. Let me show you how I think this would work. Collaborative problem solving. You have a social issue, you have a political issue. Instead of debating moralized political positions, which we do all the time, 
Instead, as I indicated before, identify the human needs that motivate these positions. I'm going to give examples of that in the case of transgenderism. Find novel ways to meet both sets of needs simultaneously by circumventing moral ideology. So here's these two people with different moral ideologies. Get rid of the political positions. Instead, focus only on the needs of the different parties and try to find constructive ways, possible solutions to meet both sets of needs simultaneously. Come up with a novel shared solution that nobody has thought of yet. That's what collaborative problem solving is all about. And we know that it works because of conflict resolution. That brings us only so far. We can't solve all problems based on human needs because human needs are in fact often created by ideology. So we've got to address differences in ideology as well. And so, but st still, instead of debating moral ideologies, how about if we try to engage those ideologies and try to actively find what I would call the kernel of truth in each party's ideology? Find the kernel of truth in each party's ideology, then construct novel, partially shared ideologies upon which we can agree. Common ground is not found. It's got to be actively created. This is the basic idea. Bracket the rest. Bracket the stuff that you can't agree on for now. Save it for later. So you've got these moralized ideologies. And you, what you want to do is you want to engage those moral ideologies. More on that in a few seconds. So here's an example. Transgenderism, very difficult issue that we're dealing with right now. Um, how can we use these principles uh, in, an, in a social justice context to uh, try to resolve some of the nasty and difficult debates uh, that we have about transgenderism? Well, let's begin and take a look at the two different camps, if you will, at their most extreme. The essentialist view. People have essential natures. Nature is encoded in biology. There are two biological sexes. There's no such thing as gender. Transgender is a kind of pathology. Sex trumps gender. This is the, if you will, uh, an essentialist view that I hope that we can, that you can see that there's a through line there of essentialism that uh, organizes the political ideology. And the other side, we have what might be called social constructionist view. People do not have essential natures, they're malleable. Identities are socially constructed, they're not engaged, they're not embedded in, in, in biology. Not only is there sex, and gender, and they are different, but gender is independent of sex is a largely prevalent social constructionist ideology. Gender is a non-binary identity that has nothing necessarily to do with sex. People self-identify gender based on deep-seated experience. Gender trumps sex. So we've got com two completely different uh, ideologies here. How can we bridge in any way this massive divide? Well, let's take a look. Let's start with collaborative problem solving with focuses on needs. Let's start by asking, what are the needs of the different people in this debate? Now, what I'm gonna do here is going to be massively incomplete, but I just tried to illustrate a process. Let's start with the needs of the person on each side, both of whom have needs for compassion, respect, and dignity, something that is lacking in virtually any uh, discussion of social justice and, um, and political uh, processes. The person on the, the essentialist person wants to acknowledge the biology of sex, I suggest. That is a need that they have to acknowledge this long standing uh, uh, traditional belief. They want to maintain, perhaps, traditional beliefs and traditional gender roles, perhaps. Whereas the person, uh, the social constructionist person, also demands and wants compassion, dignity, and respect, wants to acknowledge the social aspects of identity and support people who experience gender dysphoria. These are different needs. From a collaborative problem solving point of view, the task is how can you meet all of these needs at the same time? Is that possible? 
Um, I'm suggesting, at least with respect to the needs that I've put down there, it is. Let's move further. Compassion, respect, and dignity is at the basis of this. If we don't have that, we can't have any discussions, and that's the hardest thing. So let's look at the ideologies now. Ideological engagement. Essentialism and social constructionism. Can we find kernels of truth in the other person's ideology? Is it possible that the person, the essentialist, can find any kernels of truth in the social constructionist? Well, yes, I would say that we can. If we can create a situation of compassion and respect and safety that, that people can express their beliefs, they'll be, be, at least be able to feel. Yes, the essentialists ought to be able to believe, I suggest, that some people experience deep-seated gender dysphoria. They can, they, can, they can appreciate the idea that gender identity is not the same as biology. I'm not going to deny biology, but I can... That, but if I, that's at least something that they can agree with, I'm hoping. How about the other side? Can the social constructionists find any kernels of truth in the essentialist? Well, there are biological differences, XY and X, XX. Um, sex is defined in terms of the production of sperm and eggs. Uh, this is something that uh, is, is, is not simply socially created. Most people identify as male. Or female? Can the social constructionists agree with that? There are certain basic conditions that we ought to be able to find kernels of truth about. Now, again, this is massively simplified, but and there's much more to say. But is there a solution to this problem if we focus on both the collaborative and the ideological? I suggest there is. And this is just an example. What if we had a dual identity solution? Where their people do not have one identity, but they have at least two, and they are not independent of each other. So that there is a biological identity. What I am, I am male or female. There is a social identity. Who I am, who is different than what, who is a personal, a person category, an agentic category. And that, no, they are not independent. They are actually, they are actually distinct, but dependent upon each other in some sense. The whole idea of gender has its origins in some way in sex. They are not the same, but they are not independent either. If I have a biological identity, both the biological and the social have their own spheres of application. We don't need to deny one over the other. But the, bi the biological has, if you if you have XX or XY and et cetera, well, in a biomedical sphere of application, that's very necessary. We need to know about that. That doesn't go away. But that's not necessarily important in a social sphere of application where social identity, my bi a, binary, a binary identification or what have you, uh, it's irrelevant, the, the, the sex. It's, your, your sex is irrelevant if I invite you to a dinner party or if I'm going to um, uh, have you uh, participate in certain jobs, not all jobs. But then there's this enormous gray area between the two of these that we must, as a society, identify, take responsibility for, and figure out. For example, let's take uh, people who have biological males who in, in sports for, for, for uh, females. A big gray area in which this question of biology, I would suggest, matters. But that's an area we need to debate and take, take uh, responsibility for. The main point that I want to make here is that if we can get at compassion, respect, and dignity, if we can get at people's needs and treat each other as humans, that we care about the other person, no matter what their ideology, and we care about their needs, we're able to identify those needs and try to respect them and meet them, while at the same time, seeing the kernels of truth in the other, we should be able to come up with at least partially shared ideologies and ways of meeting each other's needs at the same time. Right now, we can't do that. We can't do that because of the moralization of our identities and the moralization of our politics, saying that there's only one way of solving these problems. Uh, and if you're not in that way, you're not part of the clan. 
So conclusions, there are multiple pathways and definitions I suggest of social justice. The currently dominant pathway risks, in my view, alienation and ineffectiveness. A relational ethos may be able to foster social justice through deeper forms, deeper forms of diversity, equality, and inclusion than is offered through current approaches. The key, I suggest, is to subordinate justification processes, the moralization, et cetera, problem, uh, to the goal of meeting the human needs of all parties to a conflict, seeing first and foremost that who I'm interacting with is a person with needs, feelings, uh, 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 that need to be respected and that we ought to care about. Thanks for listening. Okay, that gives us a lot to think about. Um, do we have any specific questions to Michael at this point? If you wish to speak, just raise your hand. Um, also need to remind you to unmute yourself if you are speaking. Well, tomorrow, um, so just so you know, there, there's a lot of activity in the chat that hopefully you're seeing. I have been following it. Good. Thank you. Um, there's obviously a lot of response to what has been shared with us. And uh, for me, myself, there's a lot of new ways for me to think about uh, social justice and how we get there. I, I come back to the definition which I uh, offered at the beginning, which is social justice is defined as full participation in society and the balancing of benefits and burdens by all citizens, resulting in equitable living and just ordering of society. Let me continue. Its attributes include fairness, equity in the distribution of power, resources, and processes, and social determinants of health, just institutions, systems, structures, policies, and processes, equity in human development, rights, and sustainability, and a sufficiency of well-being. We really do need this in this country at this point. Please. Um, Share your thoughts, your questions, your insights with what we have just heard from these three scholars. Yeah, I have one thing that I want to add. Um, all three were great, but but Mike, that especially that the idea of starting with caring, like what I thought about was from Utah's perspective, as we go up the stack from matter to life to mindedness, I just thought the first thing you want to see is the primate heart and every other human, like even before you even get into person justification systems, just that fact alone, like I started thinking, this is probably a bad example, but I started thinking about like how I relate to dogs. And like, I don't think about their justification systems because they don't have them. They're just, they're just a dog, you know? And it's like, that that's all I really think when I see a dog. And it's like, if I can at first just see a primate, like as I walk into work on Monday morning, and as I look, you know, I see Fox News and CNN on the TVs, like before I hear their justification systems, I see the primate and just care because the primate itself matters because it's made of matter and life and mindedness. And so to me, that's just where that's my, my full stop. I start there and then we'll go into justification systems. I don't know if you all want to comment on any of that, but that's what was resonating with me. Mm -hmm. That's certainly a struggle which we all have between our mindedness and our primate natures. Sometimes we don't do so well at that. I'd like to direct a couple of questions to Brad. Um, where and how do you begin social justification education? Hmm. When you say social justification education, can you maybe unpack that a little bit? What do you mean by social justice justification education? Sorry. The, the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We talk a lot about that, but I can't remember, for instance, in my training, any time when somebody said, you need to think about these things. 
Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that I, I would have benefited if somebody had said to me very early on, here are some things to think about. Mm-hmm. What's, what's the point in time when we begin to train individuals to think about how justice not only affects them, but how justice affects the other person? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. It has a lot to do with developmental psychology and child development, and also what constitutes learning and what the most effective ways of learning are at different ages. So on one frame, I'd say that there's a few different things there. One is you said justification, education. I just said for me that the process of us being in social context where we have to justify what we're doing and understand what other people are doing past and present in terms of justification. I think that's always happening. That's sort of like in the background um, all the time. And with young children, I think that they're learning a lot about values and about what's justified and what's not justified through observation and more tacitly. I think it's also, you know, from an early age, you can make things explicit in terms of values and principles. But um, my sense is that we're better served if we keep those values and principles fairly simple and straightforward when we're talking about children and not losing sight of the fact that when we become overly linguistic and abstract and didactic um, with children, it can be um, just sort of not as developmentally appropriate as we might think as adults. And one of the issues I think that we're facing is that as as our adult culture is getting more sort of complicated and caught up in abstractions and memes and and labels um, and quotes and phrases, some of which might be thought of as sort of thought terminating cliches. Like there's, there's these cliches that are said a lot and that people are taught to repeat. And there's a way in which that's anti-educational and, to, you know, like getting children to repeat things. And, you know, you also use the word training. So if our intention is to train people to say and think particular things, that is not education, that is propaganda. Right. And there's no age at which that's developmentally appropriate. That's actually just not a good thing to do. So we have to be aware as people, as adults, as educators, as parents, that we're always tuned into a quality of educational relationship where you're cultivating the agency and autonomy and thinking capacity of the other person if you're in the role of of educator or parent and even if you're in the role of something that's that's more flat and less hierarchical you know being in right relationship is really is really the key thing and that kind of brings me to sort of uh, you know uh, like thinking about what michael shared what comes up for me is you know what are the presuppositions and the values and the principles that allow what he's saying we should do to happen Right. Like we'd like you still need a certain sort of maturity and orientation toward respect and certain values around communication that that do have to be shared by all the people in that situation. Otherwise, it's going to break down and it's not going to happen. So we do have to find a way educationally and socially and culturally to get to, you know, inculcating and developing and cultivating those shared agreements and those shared principles and values, but you can't do that overly didactically by just saying, this is what you need to do. And if you don't do this, you're, you're bad. So it's, 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 um, it's subtle, it's human, it's interpersonal, and it has to be done with a certain degree of maturity and respect, which has to be grown and developed organically for each individual, which was what makes it so, so hard. Thank you, Brad. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else would like I did to have one question, Brad? What age groups do you oversee in education? Yeah, so my school is pre-K through twelfth grade, so two years old through high school. Cool. Um, okay. And I and so yeah, and I worked. I worked as an early childhood educator, though. When I was a teacher, I was actually a preschool and kindergarten teacher, and then I taught in some grad school. So I've taught grad school and I've taught 
preschool. Um, That's and, cool. Um, so you can yeah. see the full spectrum. Yeah, I really, and now being at a pre-K through 12th grade school, it's really wonderful to see the full, the full spectrum of human development really from birth to adulthood. Yeah. Steve, I would like to pose a question to you. Every time you talk about SART, I am aware that there's more that a lot more that I need to learn. Um, how do you think that he would respond if he were here in our times to the idea of social justice? You're you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. Um, for those for those who have some familiarity with the early existentialist art, it's worth noting that his thinking evolved as um, he through the second half of his um, of the 20th century, um, he moved in a direction that aligns in many respects with um, Michael's emphasis on needs. He sees need, the fulfillment of need as at the root of ethics and speaks of um, integral humanity as an overarching value. Um, this integral humanity takes into account the person as a person situated in a particular historical and cultural place. Um, the needs of individuals, though, um, there's a danger of falling prey to a kind of psychological formalism. If we use the TOK language, thinking in terms of a person as having a set of organic and perhaps even cognitive needs, if you move to the level of culture, there's a need for justification. Ultimately, um, the justification that a person is seeking is a kind of acceptance of a whole self. In fact, if you if you uh, take a detour for a moment, Eric Erickson's concept of generativity is the idea that what I'm ultimately seeking is for my entire life to have a kind of justification and all of its richness and complexity. But my life is wholly unique. Um, so in a sense, my needs are the same as everybody else's. But in another sense, they're absolutely particular to me. Um, they're particular to me insofar as I participate in a particular set of groups, and they're particular to me insofar as I have a, my own unique narrative. So the challenge we've got right now is, and, and I'm now thinking from a Sartarian perspective, is we've got basic needs that need to be fulfilled while at the same time time. We're working with people in particular social and historical contexts. Um, and that uniqueness of an individual needs to be respected as well. Concretely, I'm thinking of a, like, let's take a situation where um, a professor misgenders um, or uses an inappropriate or the um, adjective that the student would not like to have used. Um, you can read that in different ways. Um, from, from one angle, that what the student is asking for is not some acknowledgement on a in, in Tillich's language on a technical plane, but rather an invitation to the professor. I'm, I'm inviting you, I'm inducting you into a group that I'm a part of, and I want you to understand and respect. Um, and when a professor doesn't use the appropriate language in class, there's a tension. And the tension lies in a different domain than academic, abstract, technical, um, considerations that we would normally be focused on in an academic context. So how do we meet people's needs when those needs are so unique to an individual and tied to group participation? Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Michael, Michael, I'm impressed with how the system you were proposing um, addresses a problem and does so in a practical way. I, I, I find it very interesting that you have two aspects that need to be addressed very early on in interpersonal confrontations of this type that you spoke about. Uh, one is 
what are the needs of each person? And the other one is the need for compassion, respect, and identity. Um, what, what do we do if we are faced with a person, or if we even find ourselves at a point where we can't really do either one of those two things? Um, what do we do when we're faced with a situation where we can't be compassionate toward the other, uh, address their needs at the same time, um, uh, coordinate their, their ideologies in some way? Um, well, the first thing I would want to say is that, I mean, that's the first question that comes up, isn't it? And we have this default in our minds that somehow the process of managing conflict is impossible. It's somehow pie in the sky. It's 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 um, it's 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 uh, it's hokey, not realistic. Um, I think that conflict management is possible is is not always possible. It is possible far more than I think than we even imagine. And that if we, I think that the, 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 the bracket, the cynicism, the skepticism, the, the, um, the, the, um, the, 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 the bracket, the idea that it's not possible. And if you bracket that idea, we can go so much further than, um, than, uh, than we think we can. Um, in my opinion, dialectical thinking is a way of thinking that we are not good at. Dialectical thinking is thinking in opposites. Uh, has its its expression in Chinese uh, 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 yin yang. In the West, it has its expression in Hegelian uh, he Hegelian synthesis. <clears throat> is it possible to be both clothed and naked at the same time? Well, of course not. Except, of course, if you're wearing a fishnet. Okay, all right. I'm clothed and naked at the same time. I never thought of that. Boom, there it is. We are not aware of the extent to which the that the clash, the, the dialectic, the opposite itself can be broken down and reconstructed in such a way. Uh, is nature, is, is are genes the cause of development? No, it's environment is the cause of development. We've had this debate forever. And then they would come up with this compromise. Well, it's it's both. It's you know, it's sixty percent one and forty percent another. Well, all of those are wrong. <laughs> the idea is that the the initial premises were wrong. That there's never an effect of genes that is independent of an effective environment. That we have a fully epigenetic view. We've transformed and we've resolved that conflict. Um, if we don't get beyond the idea that um, that when the when the Houthis uh, bomb a, 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 a ship, that the proper response to that is de facto retaliation. Retaliation is going to go back and forth and back and forth forever. If we think, what are the needs and needs of the of the Houthis? What are the needs of the Gazans? What are the needs of the Israelis? What are the needs of the Americans? And really begin to ask those questions. We're doomed, and we're just going to continue to 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 go the same route that we've always gone. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Brandon. I believe that you have uh, something you'd like to raise, please. Uh, yes. Well, uh, this is regard to cancel culture. You know, in recent years, which uh, okay, so some people might be saying something. You know, they're coming from a position of power. Um, you know, influence, leadership, authority, and they're using their, uh, you know, their platform to denigrate, you know, people who are suppressed, you know, minorities or the people who are uh, lower on the socio uh, cultural spectrum, you know, and uh, so you had uh, Herbert Marcuse saying, you know, that that sort of thing should should be uh, disallowed or illegal. I'm, uh, and uh, Popper, uh, his uh, paradox of tolerance. So if we tolerate intolerance, then the people who are intolerant can then, you know, distort the information ecosystem and the political uh, ecosystem to the point where there's more intolerance, you know, 
Um, so, but then some some would argue, and in fact, I think uh, quite reasonably that it's been taken you know too far in recent years. Perhaps not in the last I don't know year or two, but there is definitely a point where this was uh, you know there was a an attracting force that kept wanting to have more um, suppression of these sort of uh, uh, you know oh you can't say you know something that hurts someone's feelings and <laughs> otherwise you, you just get ostracized or you can't have a job if you don't speak exactly the right way so that's cancel culture you know and um i'm not exactly sure so i mean maybe you could say that there should be certain you know forms of speech that su should be suppressed or some people are you know more free speech absolutists and wouldn't really agree with me or or popper uh, so I'm not sure where you guys would uh, stand on that. Yeah, I have some thoughts I can share. It's good to see you, Brandon. Thanks for being here. And on that note, it's it's nice to see a face. If anyone else is is able to sort of engage in a person, it helps to feel that primate heart. Um, so one thing that comes up for me is just how complex that question is because there's so many different contexts for communication and relationship. And I think there are different kinds of appropriateness for setting boundaries and sort of having membranes around certain communities. And then there's also the more general question of like information and the media ecology that's sort of uh, inclusive of literally all humans, right? So like Twitter is a very different context than a business meeting or a friendship, right? And there, there's certain kinds of communication and certain kinds of norms and boundary setting are appropriate in those different contexts. So any community, I think, has a, a right and actually an obligation and a responsibility to have some sense of clarified values and norms for what's okay and what's not okay. And you actually do have to have consequences for violating norms and behaviors with any particular group context where part of what constitutes the group is a shared agreement to those values and principles, right? So I think we're going to have nested, decentralized groups, you know, always, inevitably. And there needs to be some freedom for groups to create boundaries and norms and values and then rules for how to deal with people who violate those. So that's okay, but that can get conflated with something like Twitter or news at large, where there's actually should be a different set of values and principles operating for what, what is the intention and the principles behind something like free speech for the media or information at large? My sense is that for something like Twitter or something like journalism at large, free speech is really important. You can sort of choose to opt in or opt out. So you as an agent have freedom of what you want to engage in. But if you, but it is really dangerous, I think, when you start to thought police and suppression and limit what people even have access to in an open market of ideas. So I think you can be something of a free speech absolutist in the context of information and marketplace of ideas at large. And that is actually not in contradiction with having a context within which there are clear norms for behavior and clear consequences for violation, including someone getting expelled from a group, right? Even with the context of a school and in the context of a developing child, certain behaviors will lead you to get expelled, right? Because you start to think about the health of the community and really what that individual needs to get them on a track. Even if it's with a loving, empathetic, developmental view of what's best for that person, you still have to draw boundaries. So I think part of the issue, I'd say, I'd say there's two issues. One is clarifying different contexts, different rules for different contexts. And the other is a lack of clarified values and principles in any given context is gonna lead to problems. Thank you, Brandon. How about uh, Michael or Stephen? One thought I'll share quickly is um, one of the one of the challenges and dangers with a DEI related initiative is the emphasis or the accent could be placed on what I called earlier the inductive culture inducing um, way of thinking. And we need to also recognize that that inductive side of education is in dialectical relation with the humanistic and the technical. With respect to the humanistic, we need to see 
in fractions of group norms as possible teaching moments. Recognize that we're all developing individuals, whether we're teachers, students, administrators, um, and when we make mistakes, those mistakes um, can be part of our own growth and developmental process as a culture, incultured person. Similarly, um, we need to recognize too, the technical side of education and a recognition that um, there are group norms that we ought to embrace as part of a liberal democratic culture. Um, and these should be guiding our thinking um, in, in even as their intention, perhaps with other values. Um, so our, our challenge is to be thinking in three ways at once, technically, humanistically, and culturally, inductively. Thank you. Both what Brad said and Steve said, I did absolutely. Boy, I'm, I'm I'm blown away by that. I think it's absolutely correct. Um, uh, we got to have free speech. Um, we don't want to. We don't want to. We don't want to eliminate the speech that we hate, particularly because when we do, it festers. And it comes out in in a more virulent form. We've got to engage that speech. I think that the trick is, again, going back to what Brad and Steve said, is we've got to do it on more than one level. We don't just want to combat the person whose speech is uh, that we, we, we disagree with. We want to address their, their need. There are reasons why, for example, Trump supporters support Trump. If we demonize them and don't look at their needs, we're dead. Okay, we have absolutely no no way of 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 reaching them people those people. And the same is true on the other side. Now, the other side, we've got to be able to meet the needs of the people. In order to, to do that, you got to be able to hear the, their language, however offensive. That's what I believe. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Hey, can I ask questions that real quick, Baltimore? Sure. Yeah. So I love that. One of the things that um, I've tried to do is so I feel like I have more of a responsibility as somebody who invests in these things. It's similar to like Dunning Kruger with, you know, sort of mental models. Same thing with cultural models. Like it's my obligation as an invested person to to sort of die on that hill first. Like I have to be the one to start first rather than waiting for the other to do it. And one of the things I've done with my, cause I've got like family members who are big Trump supporters. I have other friends who are very strong, you know, evangelical Christians. And so we started doing a practice. I mean, it's basically just Dialogos, but we tried to make it explicit where we would say, all right, right now we're going to have a conversation and we're going to put on your justification system. Like we're putting on your glasses. I want to understand it, steel man it. And I want to feel into like, what's it feel like? for you as a evangelical Christian to know that I'm going to hell. Like, what does that feel like? And to, instead of me going, Oh, well, you just, you think I'm going to hell to just feel it. And then say, is that how that feels? And then he comes back and goes, that's exactly how that feels. And then we have a dialogue about it, like, what does it feel like when you ride by an abortion clinic? Like just what's that feel like? And we get into that. And then he starts to trust me and I go first, you know, but he trusts me. He's like, okay, I can put on your glasses. Like, what does it feel like? And then we get into it. And so I'm trying to do that with all my relationships where I feel the justification system, you know, you can feel it. I just try to take responsibility for it. And I'm trying to do that. Like with my son, he's 15 now, just say, okay, what, you know, experience, what's it feel like for that bully at school? Or what's it feel like for that teacher? And slowly, I mean, again, he's he's still getting it, but I think those are the practices. And I think we have to start in our little three square feet. It's the only thing I know to do. And I comment on that. I, I think that is so powerful what you just said. So deeply powerful, so deeply courageous. Um, I have a friend, Tommy, who uh, when he came out to his father or, or when they were talking about his gayness, uh, his father would say to him, how could you find those square masculine features to be attractive? I don't understand it. And Tommy said to his father, 
How do you find those curvy, feminine features attractive? And it was at that point that the father was able to see, oh, it's the same thing only in the reverse. They were able to really experience each other in the way that you just described. I, I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. Somebody raised some questions about Audrey, I believe, about gender pronouns. Do you have any further comments or questions? Anybody else? These, these three speakers are really smart guys, and I have learned a lot today. Uh, there's a lot to think about. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot more courage that has to be portrayed on my part. Mm. Does does Ron have a hand up? Is that what that is? Ron. No. Where's Ron? I don't see Ron. I see a hand image. Oh, there's Ron. Yeah, I see Ron. But... No. I mean, I have a question. I could I could ask tons okay. of questions. I feel like I'm talking too much, but um Sorry. But for, Please. for all of you, really, are you seeing I feel like I'm seeing a little bit of a shift where maybe we're as a culture entering that dialectic with the DEI movement. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have some new synthesis that becomes its own, you know, <laughs> problem. But are y'all seeing a shift? Because I feel like I am, um, but I don't, I'm not in academia. So I'm in business. So it's a little different. Yeah, I am for sure. I think we're all probably seeing it in different ways. I've seen, I've seen Testament, to it just in the in the internet sphere of discourse where you know the things like saying that we're we're post woke um so different people are seeing that we're sort of peak peak woke or post 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 peak woke in some ways and i think that's true and i think that's encouraging and uh in particular on this issue of transgenderism that michael's talking about i think there's a big shift happening where we're able to look at more empirical evidence and data and really just look at what's actually happened and what's happening and what do the impacts of policies around things like hormones um, and not just social transitioning, but medical transitioning and the relationship, the empirical data around the relationships between social transitioning and medical transitioning. That conversation is a really hard one to have for some of the free speech issues that were brought up because we're not really clear on norms and principles and values of discourse and communication. We're having a hard time having the conversation. So we need to both improve the quality of the conversation to get at what is the what are the facts of the matter, but it seems like the facts of the matter are starting to push through even a really unhealthy communicative environment. So that's encouraging. I think that's going to shift just because the truth will win out. And so far, the empirical evidence does point to the benefits of actually a slower, more thoughtful, and in many ways, less affirming approach. I think that's actually coming to light over time. And I'm seeing it personally in the, in the schools, although very slowly, it's still very much the case that there's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of people being pressured subtly or not so subtly to say and write and think the same things to to convey that they are on the good team which is in many ways sort of code for team blue and this is something that i'm trying to help people in schools point out is like if if, if your language is basically a code for that you're on team blue and you're not team red then you are actually feeding the polarization and any sort of broader educational community, do you really wanna just be on team blue or team red? Or do you wanna be a place where people who are on team blue and team red can both actually be included and you can actually include that kind of diversity and also while also instilling a cultural norm and value aspiration for people to dislodge their identity from both team red and team blue. So I think that's a framework that is really helpful for people. And I've had experiences lately where everyone's just using DEI language. Everyone is literally saying the letters DEI, DEI over and over and over again. But when you just sort of ask the question, like, how do you include people who, 
how do you include viewpoint diversity, right? Do you aspire to be a community that includes people on team red and team blue? And I've, I've only gotten positive responses to those kinds of questions, even from people who are only signaling, we're team blue, we're team blue, we're team blue. So those are the kinds of questions that we have to have the courage to ask, to shift those dynamics. Because my sense is not only do people respond, it's not only do the do team blue DEI aligned people generally respond well to those kinds of questions. In my experience, there are certainly many who won't, but they're actually hungry for it. They're lit up by it. They're actually excited. Like, wow, somebody's finally asking the question that allows us to break out of this frame and actually hold a broader, more inclusive position that is actually more aligned with our intentions towards social justice, but we're not really living it. So there's a lot of growth that can happen. And I think um, we have to make it happen. I find what you're saying quite inspirational. Uh, the idea that we're, that the truth, <laughs> the truth will out, it, that's great. My hope is that the truth will out also in what you're talking about, Brad, when you talk about the, the discursive realm. <clears throat> and I wanna refer back to something that, that Steve had brought up and, and, and the pronoun issue. Um, Note the contradiction in the pronoun issue and what we need to transcend, it seems to me. So someone wants to be treated, wants to have certain pronouns. Um, on the one hand, we want to honor that. We want to affirm the person's identity. We don't want to insult that person. We want to embrace that person. On the other hand, identity, that's not the way identities work. That self self-identification is not how identification processes develop. We don't develop our identities by identifying ourselves. We always identify ourselves in, a, in relation to others who must validate those terms and those words come from a social process. I can't identify myself any way I want to identify myself. There's a contradiction. How do we, how do we, how do we meet the needs of the individual and the needs of the uh, uh, the needs of the person who's being asked to affirm at the same time that truth also needs to be dealt with and that's a tough one there's been a i've witnessed over the last say 10 years and our institution a shift in consciousness um toward a greater recognition of impact um so i'll speak of it as a kind of shift from intention to impact intention. I'm here to explore ideas, think thoughts, consider various perspectives, play with hypotheses, and that's that. Um, and if somebody says, hey, what you said hurt me, I didn't intend that. I'm intending nothing but the best for you. I'm intending nothing but the best for my community. The shift has been toward, okay, well, wait a minute. While Perhaps an individual doesn't decide for themselves their own identity in some grand philosophical sense. All our identities are relational in essence, and I can make that argument on a technical plane. Still, what I said had an impact on you, and that impact was pain. And now I need to be conscious of that. Um, and so it's a very subtle shift from a, a focus on intentions in moral discourse to a focus on consequences. It's almost the reverse of Piaget, um, going from consequences to intentions. Um, it's a sort of inverted moral development scheme, but um, that's what I've seen. I don't mm. find that to be healthy. I wanna push back on that. Mm. Uh, I think intentions matter. Intentions matter, consequences matter. The mere fact that someone experiences pain in something that I said, has a is 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 du, there's a duality to it. I care about that pain, but mm -hmm. at the same time, that pain does not define what is what is appropriate. That's a discussion. That's a larger thing. Uh, we can't privilege one or the other or any one standard. They're always in tension and in dialect and dialogue with each other. In my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I actually I like I like this tension. I was going to say something. Similar but different in that this tension between intent and impact is a really rich one because there has been emphasis put on impact and the, the ignorance of 
intention, which is a real problem because people's intentions do matter. But at the same time, in the broader conversation where I thought Steve was going to, seeing the impact of DEI policy is actually really important because a lot of social justice activists do have good intentions, but the actual impacts of a lot of these policies and practices are not positive. And there's an accumulation of truth through empirical data that's sort of showing in various ways that we have not gotten the outcomes that we want from DEI workshops and DEI training. And because it has been too propagandistic and too ideological, it's actually had a negative impact. So even though activists may have a good intention, we do need to be aware of the fact that it's not skillful means to have ideological propaganda propagated on people. But at the same time, we still wanna honor that intention and part of the irony is that we make policies and practices more effective and have a better impact if we don't lose sight of the fact that individual intentions matter and we want to honor individuals and sort of where they're coming from, even if they don't say the right thing or they say something that could be interpreted as a microaggression or something like yeah. that. I, I assume many of us in this audience are familiar with the um, Lakhanov um, height coddling of the American mind argument and the danger mm. of allowing emotion to be a criterion of truth. And I've, I've, you know, I'm a sympathetic reader of their work and on a purely technical plane, they are absolutely right. Um, the problem is education is not purely technical and I'm using technical in the broad and culture, I mean, in the broad sense of being aware of cultural values, history, et cetera. So there's, there's a recognition, I think of or there needs to be, I'll even go so far as to say, of this tension between technical truth and what it means to be an encultured human being with a particular history um, who may be wrong about themselves, their identity, or what have you, but my act of speaking in a particular way causes them pain, and that needs to be taken into account in how I approach teaching them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, all, all great points. Sorry. So I have, I have heard a lot about things that we need to do in terms of individuals interacting. Very important things, very valuable things. How, how much difference exists between the ideas you gentlemen are presenting in terms of individual interactions, those are ideas that say how we can make it better for the individuals. What about for the collective? How do we apply these ideas to groups of individuals? Or do we? I would like to ask Brad, to answer that question. <laughs> and the reason why I want to ask Brad to answer that question is because you were talking about social media before. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the structure of social media. The structure of social media is such that it it it, it foments these problems. How do we get at what do we do about social, the culture of social, the structure of it? How do we transform the structure of that? Uh and similar ubiquitous cultural technological processes to get people to be responsive and responsible to each other in ways that social media isn't. That's how I would, that's, I yeah. don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, well, for me, there's the similar thoughts to the sort of free speech and cancellation question, because there's so many layers to different kinds of groups, right? I think a lot of what we're saying, Waldemar, does relate definitely to groups, but maybe especially what you're pointing to as small groups. Like if I'm thinking about my organization or some, or some collective, you know, we can establish certain principles and values around norms of communication and how to work with each other and how to balance our intent and our impact. And it gets so much more complicated if you scale up to talking about things like social media and then the feedback loops that come into play in terms of the, the, the norms and values and principles that are operating mostly unconsciously through those structures of communication and then how the 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 lack of healthy and quality communication in those big 
um, sort of mega structures influences how we get used to interacting with each other in smaller groups is really insidious. So that's one reason why we have to clarify what are the values and principles that should be animating social media and what are these, what, what are the sort of um, mostly non-explicit values that are animating things like the algorithms that determine what we see. And I think we could do a lot of work there and make some big improvements in terms of transparency around that and open sourcing things like that. And so that we can have more agency and more freedom in understanding and determining what we're exposed to, because right now our sort of media ecology is oriented toward attention capture, right? So that the underlying, the underlying principle or value or intention of social media is attention capture. That is antithetical, I think, to creating a healthy media ecology that is oriented toward deeper learning, deeper understanding, shared shared pathos and logos with people. So that is a key point. It's it's important. We need to shift it. We need to actually find a way to create systems of communication and and media sharing that are not oriented toward attention capture. And we could actually do that. And we're getting to the point in our collective consciousness where many of us are becoming aware that that is the case and that is a problem. But because they're so centralized through particular actors who control those systems, they're not incentivized to actually change how those systems work because attention capture leads to profit capture. So the relationship between attention and profit and polarization is this sort of interdependent, really insidious system of feedback loops that we're caught up in right now. And many of us are seeing that that is a key problem, but we do not yet have the ear of or the power of Elon Musk and Google and the people who control these systems. So that's the issue and that's where we need to get to, but how to actually change it, we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, what I took from what you just said, Brad, uh, was the normative aspect of this. Um, what did you say? Attention capture. Attention capture equals ego. <laughs> it's about ego. If we, you know, we need an ethos, a normativity. We need important, prominent, prominent people to say, "Hey, we need to relate to each other. We need to change the the norms." No, it's not okay to attention ca capture. It's just it's time to start to engage. Time to to act in ways that foster the relationship rather than the self. Yeah. That's what I you took can, from what you said. Yeah. We can start by getting kids off cell phones. I agree with Height and Lukianoff on that one. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's very possible at the individual family level. It's hard to scale it because of, again, all, all, all the confusion that I pointed to at the beginning and all the unfortunate incentive structures that I just described in social media, they're, they're unfortunately causing, uh, made, they're making it really hard to create coherence in terms of shared, shared values. Like, and well, yeah, l last thought on that is one thing I'm noticing that's particularly challenging and tragic is that my experience working with parents, for instance, just to nail down on this issue of social media and young people, my sense is that many, many parents basically agree in principle with, with what I would have to share about that topic. And they generally can see that social media is problematic and the evidence is accumulating and the sort of truth is winning out in that sense of like, wow, this really isn't good for kids. But for some reason, it's really hard to create the firm boundaries and to enliven and embody those principles and values at the level of the family, if they're not supported and shared more collectively with other families, right? And you get into really unfortunate social dynamics where you're forced as a nuclear family to take a stand against something that everything around you is, is against and not supportive of. And that's a deep human problem. And it's really weird to be in a nuclear family in a culture where the values of the culture are antithetical to the values of your family, even if you're actually surrounded by families that share your values, you still all end up feeling like you're all surrounded by 
a culture that's antithetical to those values. And the tide is painfully and slowly turning there, I think, but it's it's slow and painful. Perhaps it would help if we could define what, what are the goals for each child at levels of development. So for instance, a cell phone for a six-year-old, what should it accomplish as opposed to a cell phone for somebody in 12th grade? I think it's it's different for individuals and maybe it can be um, parsed out so that, yeah, these are the things we want a cell phone to be able to do and a child to be able to access at age X. And these are the ones that we expect of ourselves as um, adults, if you will. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know what those rules are. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm well positioned to take a quick stab at that. And then we also probably have to think about wrapping. But I would just say, just to give you an example, at age six, I'm not aware of any well-justified or coherent reason why a six-year-old should have a cell phone. As a Bingo. child gets into middle school, they enter social dynamics and desires for communication where it might become reasonable to get a non-smart phone or a smartphone that is very limited capacity so that they can take pictures and listen to audiobooks and music and send texts and talk on the phone. So I'd say that becomes developmentally appropriate around adolescence. And I'd say that continues, from my sense, is through high school, is having limited capabilities for communication, for socialization, so that you're not ostracized or separated from your peer community, which is really important. But open access to the internet and pornography and YouTube and social media, in my mind, is not something that any minor um, human, minor meaning under the age of 18, maybe 16, but I'd personally say 18. To me, that is actually not justified to bring it back to justification. I don't think there's a really strong enough justification to put unlimited use cell phones that are designed for adults in the hands of people who are not adults. Yeah, I, I think that the very thing that you said, perhaps that would be helpful if we could share that with all parents so that they could then decide, gee, this is an option I could use. Yeah. I'm trying, man. I'm trying to get the word out. And there's lots of options now. There's lots of phones that have limited use, like um, yeah, brick phones, Trumi phones, pinwheel phones. Hey, Brad, just as a piece of encouragement, I have a 15-year-old. He's in 10th grade. And of course, he's got a phone. He's had one, I think, since seventh grade. And it is what it is, <laughs> you know. But even he says, he's like, Dad, I can tell what social media is doing to me. Because we talk about it. I'm like, can you feel that? Like, do you feel a comparison? Do you feel less than? Are you, you know, have you seen pornography and those kind of things? And he's he's removing himself now. He's like, I see what it's doing. And so, and he said his friends are having that same conversation. So they realize, I think they're stuck going, man, I want to be part of the crew, but I also see what this is doing to me. So I don't know what to do, but at least there's energy there. That's something. Yeah. Young people are seeing that it's not good for them. It's still hard for them to stop, but they're definitely seeing it for themselves. The question of developmentally, what would a, what would social media be look like or justified in my question is in my opinion is not a technical one it is a value orientation uh it, it, there's there's no technical answer to that question uh cell phones are new <laughs> the mere fact that uh that's that adolescents need social contact does not mean that they need cell phones <laughs> uh, there's many ways to do that and adults ought to be in the driver's seat here and and to take responsibility uh, for what they think is 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 right and not to succumb to these social pressures, especially at the level of the school and at these larger structural levels that are destroying us. Any further comments, suggestions, ideas? I think we have had a remarkably good session here. I have learned a lot and have a lot to think about. And I think... Um, Andrew for the technical help and our three speakers for the ideas which they have shared. There are many, many good ones there. Uh, if there are no further comments, I, I believe we 
can probably end. Is that right, Andrew? Yeah, perfect timing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for attending. We appreciate all comments that were made. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.